Thank you for that very warm welcome. Uh, last night we were at Hill Auditorium and uh, that other school down south, um, where, which is, by the way, my alma mater, as you probably read in the program. And yesterday I had the home court advantage. I, I hope that the, the welcome is evident that I don't need home court advantage today. You've all been so cordial and nice. But I'll tell you one thing that the University of Michigan taught me in the seven years I was there, and it wasn't just undergrad. I actually was there for two degrees. Um, it gave me the good sense to marry a Spartan. <laughs> and she's been by my side and just uh, so wonderful. And uh, I've been able to meet uh, so many other good Spartans. My good friend Chris Brooks happens to be in the house, who's also a wonderful uh, product of this university. We're talking about this idea of the post-truth culture. And as we talk about this, I'm reminded of something that happened to me relatively recently. I was traveling to a speaking engagement, one of the ones that I get to actually drive to, because it was in Ontario, Canada. And <clears throat> being from Michigan, I have to cross a river to get there. Now, it wasn't like the, uh, down by the, you know, the tunnel in Detroit or the Windsor uh, area, so I had to cross over by Algonac, uh, which is a very narrow part of the river. In order to do that, I had to put my car on a car ferry. Now, I'm from Michigan, so all the car ferries I'm used to are the 15, 16, 17, 20 uh, capacity car ferries that can cross Lake Michigan or go across the Mackinac Island or whatever it might be. Uh, this was not one of those. It kind of fit on this stage, it was so small. So when I pulled up to the car ferry, there's only room for two cars, and the guy said, don't worry about it, don't get out of your car, just stay in your car, because there's going to be a short ride. So I stayed in the car, and it was hot outside, so the air conditioning was a blessing. Stayed in the car, and I looked down at my GPS system as we began to, we left the dock. So I looked down at the GPS system just to make sure I had the right, you know, destination in there. So as we left the dock, I couldn't see us leave. Because I was in a car and the suspension was there, I couldn't feel us leave either. The car rocked as the boat rocked as it was sitting in the dock, so I couldn't tell if we had left by feel. So I couldn't see if we had left, I couldn't tell if we had left by feeling, and then when I looked up, the river was moving. And I had this strange vertigo that you've probably had before, where you're sitting at an intersection and the bus next to you begins to move and you're not sure if it's going forward or you're going backward. And there's that momentary vertigo and you look for something that's not moving in order to get your bearings back. Well, that wasn't going to help me very much in this particular instance because I was on a river. Everything was moving. So the river wouldn't help me. The boat couldn't help me. My car couldn't help me. I had to look to the distant shore to see the land, the foundation, the unmoving part that could help me know whether I was moving. And when I finally saw the foundation, all of my confusion and my vertigo and my slight nausea went away. When we look at society today, so we're like on the river now. And we seem to like being on the river. We don't want to have fixed points of reference. We want to float along, either being carried by the waves or swim against the current, whatever our personal preference has to be, because that's what is important nowadays. Not what's true, but what's preferable. That's why the Oxford English Dictionaries, toward the end of 2016, actually named post-truth as its word of the year. Now, the word of the year doesn't have to be a new word, it just has to be a word that captures the ethos or the passion of the culture for that particular year. And a post-truth, the word post-truth was actually used 2,000 more times in 2016 than in the years before that. And what a post-truth society is, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, is one that elevates preferences and opinions over facts and truth. It elevates preferences and opinions over facts and truth. So it recognizes, in distinction to postmodernism, it recognizes that truth actually exists. It just elevates preferences over it. Truth exists, we kind of don't care, as long as we get what we want. And there are those the men of steel and the women of steel who want to tell you that their voices can get you what you want. And they're the ones who say, we have the answers. But all of this is leading to a culture of confusion. It reminds me of the song that was so um, popular in the 80s when I was growing up, which dates me terribly, but a song called The Land of Confusion by the band Genesis, which was popular during the Cold War when everyone was afraid that the Russians and the United States would annihilate the entire world. Remember what the words were? Oh, Superman, where are you now when everything's gone wrong somehow? These men of steel, these men of power are losing control by the hour. Does that not describe today? Could that song not be written yesterday? We're afloat in this culture of confusion. But how did we get here? 
How do we arrive at a place where your truth is not as important as personal preferences, even when we acknowledge it exists? Biblically speaking, I'll tell you this. If you go back to the very beginning, the Bible actually describes for you and for me how this happened. You see, the post-truth culture is not new. It germinated in a garden many, 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 many centuries ago. It's only come to full fruition and flowering in our day. Adam and Eve, the Bible says, walked and talked with God in the cool of the day. They literally had an experience with the very essence of truth. And God said to them, all of this is yours, but if you, don't, if you eat of this one tree, that's the problem. Don't eat of this one tree. And then Satan comes along and says, did God really say that? Did God really say don't eat of this and yet you really die in the very day that you eat of this? God doesn't want you to eat this tree because when you eat this tree, you'll be like God. You'll be able to determine what's right and what's wrong. They had the truth. They knew the truth, but they preferred autonomy. They wanted to be God, not to be with God. He offered them relationship and they rejected it. They said, we want autonomy. This is something that's been endemic, I think, in society ever since those days. When you ask, when you look at the, 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 the philosophical big boys and the, all these men, you look at Protagoras, for example, when he said, man is the measure of all things. Because there is no higher reference, there, there is no higher power than us. We are the ultimate in reason. So man or humanity is the measure of all things. If humanity can be the measure of all things, then maybe humanity can be the determiner of all things too. We get to decide not only if it's true, but whether in fact it's true just because of our will. It's not a new thing, this culture we're in. It germinated in the garden, it was seeded through the philosophers, and it's come to fruition today through social media and other places. Why has this happened? Why? I firmly believe this. We recognize truth but subordinate it to preference because we have sacrificed truth and clarity on the altar of human autonomy. What I mean by autonomy is not freedom. They're not the same thing. Autonomy has at its root, the, the root of the word autonomy are two words, autos meaning self and nomos meaning law. We are a law unto ourself. I'm a law unto myself. I get to decide what's right and wrong for myself, and you get to do the same thing. The problem is when we collide. If I'm a law unto myself and you're a law unto yourself because we're so autonomous, there's going to come a time when my set of values is going to collide with your set of values. And yet we try to get this, um, this society where we actually have a shared set of values. Listen to what Tom Flynn says. Tom Flynn's a secular humanist. He believes in truth. He just doesn't agree with my set, what I think is the truth, but he believes in truth. And he says, look, through a secular process of value inquiry informed by scientific and reflective thought, men and women can reach rough agreement concerning values, crafting ethical systems that deliver optimal results for human beings in a broad spectrum of circumstances. It's important to hear what he said. He said, through a process of value inquiry informed by scientific and reflective thought, we can reach rough agreement concerning values and ethical systems. My question for you is this, has that agreement actually come in our day? Are you agreeing with everybody? Do you see the world agreeing with everybody? Hardly speaking. What it's led to are a couple of things that I want to point out to you. This post-truth mindset that elevates preferences over truth has led to a couple of things. It has not led to autonomy and liberation. It's led to chaos. The first thing it's led to is a sense of anger and vilification. It's what I call the Hitlerization of social commentary. If you don't agree with me, you're Hitler. That's happened now, hasn't it? And I don't mean if you disagree with me, I mean if you don't agree with me, even a, if, a lack of assent, if you're neutral, somehow, well, maybe not you're Hitler, maybe you're a Mussolini, you're not that bad. <laughs> it's led to that kind of a thing. But it's also led to an anger where we see not the quest for justice, we see the quest for just us. As my colleague Oz Guinness has put it. Is that not happening today? See, when human autonomy collides, you get this sense of chaos. If my set of values, because I've determined what they are, without a, a, a fixed point of reference, which I think is transcendent, and you have your own sort of set of values, when we're gonna collide, who is the arbiter between us? It's not gonna be the truth, because preferences are above truth. And if it's not truth, then the one who wins, the preferences that win, are the ones with the most guns. The law of the jungle, not the law of civilization. 
And contrary to Tom Flynn's optimistic humanism that says we can reach rough agreement, all we've done is agree to be rough. Ask anybody from the, from the other side of the world how tough it is to stand with your convictions and you find out just how rough that agreement actually is. So it's led to an anger and a vilification. The second thing it's done is led to a loss of integrity. We're spreading, quote unquote, fake news left, right, and center now. I don't care if you're on uh, one side of the political spectrum or another, or even if you're in the middle. It's part of that vilification. Only if you're on the right, only the left spreads lies. And if you're on the left, only the right spreads lies. And if you're in the center, all the extremists on the right and the left spread lies. We never look into our own hearts and see that maybe we have been the ones with a lack of integrity once in a while. We're not all perfect, we're not. And then maybe we have succumbed to the temptation to share an article only of which the headline we've read, not the actual article, to see what it says because it helps our position. This is also bled into the sciences, by the way. When you look at the article in Smithsonian Magazine in January of 2016, it follows up on some studies on the reportability or the reproducibility of scientific published scientific works, and it found that in various fields, at most 40% of the findings that are published in scientific journals can be reproduced because people either were fudging the data or hiding their protocols. That's dismal. Now, I'm not saying we should abandon the scientific inquiry. I dare not say it because there are people who are watching this via live stream right now who are able to do that because of scientific inquiry. Thank goodness, thank God for science. I'm saying we lost our integrity and our ability to actually do it well because we've elevated preferences and our preference to be published or our preference to get tenure or whatever it might be over truth. And the third thing that's led to is a loss of a sense of reason. You know, not, not too long ago, I was giving a talk at a breakfast and I was talking about the comparison of various worldviews and various world religions and these kind of things. And there was a guy sitting in the front row who was taking copious notes. I, so fast that, the, that there was smoke emanating from the, the paper, it seemed to me. Like, this guy's going to catch on fire. Where's the fire extinguisher? And sure enough, he was the, one of the first people to ask me a question. A very thoughtful guy, by the way. And he came up to me and said, can I share something with you? Which is actually a signal for, this is going to be a while. Um, which is okay with me, I like the long conversations. And he had a diagram he was showing me. And in the diagram, in the middle of the diagram was a big capital T with a circle around it. And then around the capital T were all these little lowercase t's. And they were pointing with arrows towards the capital T. He said, I believe in objective truth and that there is one out there, but we don't know all of it. And so far, we're in agreement. I don't know all the truth. If I did, I'd be God. Clearly, I'm not. I believe in truth as well. He says, but we all have, we're all the lowercase t's, that's who we are. We have versions of the truth as incomplete as they may be, and we're getting there eventually. But we all have versions of the truth. And I said, really? All of us do? Pol Pot? Mao Zedong? Joseph Stalin? Adolf Hitler? Carrot Top? I mean, all of us? <laughs> he said, well, I can tell you this, except for Carrot Top, he said, I can't tell you that I approve of their version of the truth, but I can't say I disagree with their version of the truth. If anyone's safe to disagree with, Stalin is it. Hitler's okay to disagree with. But he said he couldn't do that. I said, wait a minute, are you telling me you can't disagree with anybody? He said, that's right, I can't do that. I said, sure you can. He says, no, I can't. I said, you just did it. <laughs> Years of legal training has taught me how to do that. It wasn't intended to shut him up or to do a gotcha moment. The point was to show him, I think, the logical outworking of a belief where you prefer to say everyone's right because it's uncomfortable to say that people are making truth claims and we have to test them. Do you see what's happened? We've elevated ourselves to our preferences are that those people are demons because they don't agree with me. That's preferable because it's comfortable. We've elevated ourselves to a lack of integrity because doing the hard work of parsing out the truth, that's not comfortable. It's pre preferable that I get ahead by fudging the data a little bit or maybe spreading a few things that help my message but aren't actually true. Or it's preferable to say that everyone believes the same thing so we don't have to actually do the hard work of deciding who's right and who's wrong. But C.S. Lewis made an interesting statement about this. He said, if you look for comfort, in other words, preference, if you look for comfort, you won't get it. What he says is this, if you look for truth, you may find comfort. And we used to look for truth. 
If you look for truth, you may find comfort, but if you look for comfort, you will get neither truth nor comfort, only soft soap to begin with, but in the end, despair. We've been looking for comfort for some time now, and the soft soap has come, but now is the age where despair is set in. Is there a way out of this? Is there a way to get this culture of truth back? I think yes, the answer is yes, because we have to find this true source of human freedom. See, the culture rejects the biblical narrative, the biblical ideas of, free, of what it says as freedom, because it thinks that the Bible is unnecessarily strict. It restricts us and limits human freedom in, in all as, uh, facets of life. But the problem is we've misunderstood the Bible because we've misunderstood freedom in the first place. We want autonomy to be a law unto ourselves. The Bible actually does stand against unfettered human autonomy because it knows that that leads to chaos. What the Bible actually is for is for freedom, and freedom necessarily has boundaries. I'll give you an example of this. I have three kids, and when they were much younger, we, had a, we have a backyard that backs up to a main road. And when they were much younger, if there were no boundaries between my backyard and the main road, there'd be no way they had the freedom to play in that backyard, because if the ball went over into the main road, they would certainly be killed. And so if there's no boundaries, then there's no freedom to play in the backyard. But the necessary and sufficient, not too many, but enough boundaries allowed for them to play in the backyard and enjoy the very purpose of that backyard. When we remove the boundaries, remove the fences, we lose that sense of purpose and we lose that true freedom. The Bible is not against your freedom, it's very much in favor of it because he doesn't want you to result in chaos. And Jesus claims to be the true source of that freedom. And he makes a statement, it's pretty interesting. He says, freedom is inextricably intertwined with truth. Listen to the words he says in John chapter eight. So Jesus said to those who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say we will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. Now listen to this. He says, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free and the son sets you free indeed. The truth sets you free and the son of God sets you free. The truth is the son of God. Now, why I think that's important is because you can say that's an audacious statement. How dare you make such a claim? It's an audacious statement. I didn't say it, I just quoted it. But Jesus makes this audacious statement to be truth personified. And you might be asking the question, why should we believe that? Who do you, who does he think he is? You know what? The people who were around him asked that very reasonable question as well. They said, who does this man think he is? They asked, he asked him directly, who do you think you are? And he said, if you destroy my body, I will raise it up again in three days. That's either true or it's false. If the body stayed in the tomb, he's a charlatan. If the body didn't stay in the tomb and it, and, and it was risen from the dead, then he is to be believed. People often ask me, why, when Jesus says he's the way, the truth, and the life, why do you believe him? Having seen the historical evidence that Jesus actually did rise from the dead, a very defensible case for the historical resurrection, I say this, I believe Jesus because he rose from the dead and guys who rise from the dead have credibility. Now, the culture says that preferences over truth leads to autonomy. The Bible points out that autonomy over truth leads to chaos. But Jesus says that he is the embodiment of truth and he sets you free. What is that freedom he sets you free to? Two things. It sets you free to the knowledge of who you and I really are. And there's this sort of dichotomy between these things. One is that we're sinners, every one of us, you and I. None of us is perfect, and if you're perfect, raise your hand, come on up here. Um, but here's how I know you're not. If I could take the thoughts you had in your head for the past 24 hours and put them on these two screens to show to everybody right now, who's gonna volunteer? I doubt you would. And if you say I will, then you're, you're, then you're, you're breaking commandment, you're lying. That's what it means to be in need of a savior. 
Jesus says that out of your heart and my heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, fan, uh, uh, slander, false testimony, and all these terrible things that defile somebody. He described me. I'm not saying this about you. I'm saying this about me. And you know it's about you as well. He doesn't tell you. See, Jesus is not a post-truth man. A post-truth man would tell you what you prefer to hear, not what's actually true. Jesus tells you what is true, not what you want to hear. He's not trying to sell you something. He's trying to tell you like it is. That's refreshing because he's not interested in popularity. If he was interested in popularity, he'd tell you, do enough good things and you can get to God or you can become God yourself or whatever it was. He didn't tell you that. He'd tell you you're a sinner in need of a savior. But why is the salvation even offered in the first place? Because of the other part of the dichotomy. Not only are you a sinner, but you are in fact made in the imago Dei. You're made in the image of God, and that gives you an essential worth that allows you the privilege of knowing who God is if you but accept what he's done for you. He's offered you that salvation because you, regardless of your beliefs, regardless of where you come from, regardless of all these things, if you accept what he's done, that is salvation. A sinner but made in the image of God. That's the truth. I want to close with something. And then Robbie's going to come speak to us. Jesus claimed to be the truth that sets us free. And for 2,000 years, we've been elevating personal preferences over truth and sort of medicating ourselves with things that are neither personal nor true. We elevate personal preference over truth, but we medicate ourselves every day with things that are neither personal nor true. Reminds me of the song from Crash Parallel, a Canadian band who had that song, Rain Delays, Sleepless Nights and Endless Days, Mini Skirts and Serving Trays and Waking Up from Rain Delays and Selling Sex for Pocket Change and Living Off the Alcohol with No One But a Cab to Call, Lost Inside a Bathroom Stall, This Carbon Copied Life Withdrawal. I need someone to believe in. Driving cars we can't afford, just making sure we're never bored, living off our own accord between coffee grounds and corner stores, and chasing dreams with fishing nets, and limousines and cigarettes, and long weekends without regrets. Well, no one here is taking bets. I need someone to believe in, someone to fill this space with grace, to look into my eyes and touch my face, someone to make me belong, someone to make me strong, someone to make me alive. We're looking for things that are neither true nor personal. And Jesus says, I am the very personification of truth. I want to invite you to consider that. We elevate personal preference over truth, but we can find real freedom in Jesus because in him and in him alone, truth is personal. Thank you so much. God bless everybody. Come on up and speak. One good thing about following Abdu is there's very little left to say. He does such a masterful job. My honor to be here. Thank you for coming out on an evening like this and just about filling this place out. It's my honor to be here. I was just sitting here thinking of the irony of this. One is a Lebanese stock. I'm of Indian stock. And here we are at the University of Michigan telling Michigan, Michigan State, saying, ask us anything, whatever you want. We were in Michigan yesterday, Michigan State today. I didn't marry somebody from Michigan State, but I married a woman who was in great state. And we've been married now sort of 50, you know, not quite 50, 45 years we have, and wonderful to have that relationship. This is my first time here. I had been at the University of Michigan many, many years ago, and it was nice to be back there last night, and nice to be in your presence and have this tremendous audience. Let me start off with a light-hearted story that I think might give you a little something to chuckle about. There's this Indian guy who's flying on a plane and sitting next to Albert Einstein. Uh, now you can tell the imagination is running wild. So Einstein looks at him and says, you know, we've got a long flight. Why don't we play a game? I'll ask you a question. If you can't answer it, you pay me $10. He says, wait a minute, you're Einstein. He says, yeah, but then you ask me a question. If I can't answer it, I'll pay you $50. He said, so if you can't answer my question, you pay me $50, he said to Einstein. He said, that's right. And if I can't answer your question, I just pay you $10. He said, that's right. 
He said, well, sounds fair. Let's go for two or three rounds. But since you began this, Mr. Einstein, what is your first question for me? And the Einstein said, how far is the moon from the earth? And the Indian said, you know what? I have a general idea, but uh, I don't think I have the exact distance. So here is $10 for you. So he, Einstein said, now it's your question. So the Indian said, what goes up the mountain with three legs and comes down with four legs? And Einstein started thinking of all of his studies in entomology and so on and so forth. What goes up the mountain with three legs and comes down with four legs? And Einstein dipped into his pocket and gave the Indian $50. So now it was uh, Einstein's turn again. He said, before I ask you my question, what does go up the mountain with three legs and come down with four legs? And the Indian dipped his hand into the pocket and gave him $10. So I don't know how this Q&A time is going to go with a Lebanese and an Indian, but I hope there's not big money involved in this. Post-mortem of a post-truth culture. Many years ago, when I was spending a semester at Cambridge in England in 1990, in the middle of that semester, I took my oldest daughter and my second daughter, Sarah and Naomi, and my wife, and we went to witness a trial at the Old Bailey. You can go into the galleries and watch a trial in progress, provided it is not of a subject matter where a minor cannot come in. And as it happened, when we walked into the galleries and sat down, there was a guard standing there. And when he saw our two girls, he said, how old are you? And the second one was a little too young for it. He said, I cannot allow you to come, but I can allow your older daughter to come. And she was at that time uh, uh, 15, our oldest daughter. So my wife and I and a couple of friends and Sarah sat in the gallery. My second daughter and son were being taken care of by somebody. Unknown to us, it was a very, very hard trial to sit through. There were two young minor gals who had charged a middle-aged man with having raped them several months ago. And because they were minors, they were not in the center of the courtroom. They were secluded in private rooms, and only the attorneys could take a look at them through a television screen and asking them questions. We couldn't see them, but we could see the man who was charged. And I remember how the human heart works immediately, looking at him and starting to make some judgments which were not good and probably not even fair. But I thought to myself, how could a man like this sitting there have exploited and abused two young gals like that? And the questioning began. We sat through it. My daughter who wanted to go into law later on said, I really want to watch this dad. And then the man defending this client took to the lectern. And he said something fascinating to begin with. He looked at the television monitors and he said, I want you girls to know, I am not here to hurt you. I am not here to make it difficult for you. I am not here to embarrass you. And if you don't want to get into any details, you don't need to get into any details. But I want to tell you why I'm going to talk to you. I'm only interested in one thing, just one thing. When I ask you a question, tell me the truth. It's all I want to know. And if you don't want to answer the question, I will allow you to say, I don't want to answer that question. But if you answer my question, tell me the truth. Do you understand what I'm saying? And the girl said, yes, we do. So he began. He said, you know, this happened many, many months ago. Why did you choose to wait so many months before you told your parents? And they went into their answers in a childlike way, and you were listening to their sweet little voices. And the, 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 the resistance to that individual was building the whole time. But then he shot this question. He said, is it true that on the night you told your parents, one hour before that, this man saw you at a place that you did not wish to be seen and when he saw you, you expressed shock. 
and he told you when he got back home that night, he was going to come up to your home that evening and tell your mommy and daddy where he saw you and what you were doing. Is that true? There's one was silence and the other one said, um, I can't remember. I can't remember. He said, okay. And gradually the case began to collapse. I don't know what really happened. I couldn't know with the brevity of time that we were there. But it was amazing that my 15-year-old daughter too, as we walked out, Dad, something's not right with this whole story. Something's not right. You see, whatever was going to happen that night, one of two things was a certainty that a man's reputation was going to be tarnished. And the other certainty was, if it truly happened, two young girls' lives were going to be permanently damaged physically, psychologically, emotionally. Which means we needed to know the truth. What really happened? Truth is primarily a property of propositions which conforms to reality when an assertion is made as that reality really is. That's why Winston Churchill, talking about warfare, made this comment. He said, the most valuable thing in the world is the truth. The most valuable thing in the world is the truth. In fact, it is so valuable that oftentimes it is hidden by a bodyguard of lies. Natan Sharansky, the Soviet political prisoner, when he was released and went on to uh, his homeland of Israel, came back returning with his wife. And as he went to the prison where he'd been incarcerated for all those years in solitary confinement, asked if he would go enter in. And as his wife was holding his arm and walking in, he paused and said, do you mind? if I go at it alone for the first few minutes, because this is where I actually found myself. She stepped back. He went in. Came back about 30 minutes later, and it was obvious the tears had been running down his face. And he asked for his wife to see the prison, and then he said, before I talk to you as press reporters, can I please go to the gravesite of the great physicist Andrei Sakharov, who gave to us the atomic bomb? I want to lay a wreath at his grave. And they wondered what was happening. So he goes and lays a wreath at the grave of Andrei Sakharov and comes back to a battery of microphones and he says this to the media. He said, before Sakharov died, he made this comment. He said, I always thought that the most powerful weapon in the world, the most powerful weapon in the world was the atomic bomb. He said, I have changed my mind. The most powerful weapon in the world is not the atomic bomb. The most powerful weapon in the world is the truth. It's the most valuable thing in the world, says Churchill. It's the most powerful weapon in the world, says Andrei Sakharov. And you and I now live in a post-truth culture, so-called. There's a soft meaning to it, which Abdu has dealt with, and the idea being that my feelings and emotions and desires outweigh the facts. But there's a hard reality to the post-truth culture. It goes one step further. I am giving myself permission to even fabricate a story and manufacture a story and tell you things that I know are untrue because the goal I have in mind is a noble goal for something greater. So I can make up stories which are untrue in order to attain a greater end. That is really the hard meaning of the post-truth culture and The Economist magazine which dealt with it gives these ideas to you and to me. The soft version, the facts don't matter, my feelings and desires do. The harder version, I'm even allowed to fabricate and tell you falsehoods in order that I may attain something even greater. Many years ago, the former Soviet Union shot down the plane KAL-007. I remember many times taking that flight and my wife taking it. And I shuddered when I saw that it had been shot down by a pair of planes and all of those on board came just spilling down to the earth 
in bits and pieces. And there the Korean people were waiting at the Seoul airport, waiting for their family to arrive, only to find out the commercial airliner had been gunned down by the Soviets. An interchange took place. And the fascinating thing is uh, that you had uh, Vladimir Posner of Pravda interacting with William Sapphire on the American side. And William Sapphire asking Posner, how in the name of reason could you do this? And he went on to say, Posner said, well, you know, the lights of the plane were not on. We commanded the captain to turn the lights on and he did not turn the lights on. We had no choice but to conclude it, it was on an espionage, espionage mission. William Sapphire looked at him and said, that's interesting, Vladimir. In the script that we now have from the black box, it says that the lights were on. Posner said, you got that wrong, Mr. Sapphire. What was happening was the two Russian pilots, one on either side of this plane, when they referred to the lights being on, one pilot was referring to the other pilot's lights being on, not the commercial airliner. Sapphire shot back. He said, do you want me to give you the exact wording of what one of your pilots said to the other pilot? He said, Vladimir, here are the words. Target's lights are on. There was spin drop, silence. The irony of the Russian newspaper is that it's called Pravda, which means truth. When I had the privilege of speaking at their geopolitical strategy in Moscow with a whole faculty of atheists in front of me, I'll never forget the closing lines as we walked out. For about three hours, I was grilled in us to be defending theism. It was a torturous th three hours with the hostile looks in their eyes. My wife was sitting next to me, one of my colleagues. As I answered their question, one after another, one after another, you could see the softening come upon their faces. And then they lined up in order to bid us goodbye. They took the back of my wife's hand and kissed her hand. And then when my turn came, the head of that institute with four stories, below ground, eight stories above ground, where all of their leaders have been trained and all of their pictures on the wall, grabbed my hand and he said, Mr. Zacharias, I want to thank you for coming here. I believe what you have said today to be the truth, but it's very difficult to change after 70 years of believing a lie. It's very difficult to change after 70 years of believing a lie. I want to take you through a short journey on what the whole idea of truth really means and why it is so relevant. One of my great heroes was Malcolm Muggeridge, the British journalist, and he wrote these two statements in different settings. And by the way, Muggeridge was a, a man leaning towards Marxism and communism, and he went as a young journalist to Russia with the desire to emulate it and embrace it when he saw all that the tyranny under Stalin had taken place and 15 million of the Russian people slaughtered at his behest, he wrote a lot of things about it, especially in his book, Winter in Moscow. But one of the statements he made in his article was this, truth is very beautiful, more so I consider than justice today's pursuit, which easily puts on a false face. In the nearly seven decades I have lived through, the world has overflowed with bloodshed and explosions whose dust has never had time to settle before others have erupted, all in purportedly just causes. The quest for justice continues today while the weapons of hatred are piling up. But truth was an early casualty. The lies on behalf of which our wars have been fought and our peace treaties concluded. The lies of revolution and counter-revolution. The lies of advertising of news and of salesmanship, of politics. The lies of the priest in his pulpit, the professor at his podium, the journalist at his typewriter. The lies stuck like a fishbone in the throat of the microphone. The handheld lies of the prowling camera men. Ignatius alone told me once how when he was a member of the old common turn, some stratagem was under discussion and a delegate, a newcomer who had never attended before made the extraordinary observation that if such and such a statement were to be made, it ought not to be made because it wouldn't be true. 
There was a moment of dazed, stunned silence, and then everyone began to laugh. They laughed and laughed till tears ran down their cheeks and the Kremlin halls seemed to shake. The same laughter echoes in every council chamber and cabinet room. Wherever two or more are gathered to exercise authority, it is truth that has died, not God, says Muggeridge. And Muggeridge in his own journey to Christ had an amazing path to follow when he wrote the book, Jesus Rediscovered. I had the privilege of spending a day with him in England seven months before he died, as he was telling me he would be willing to write the foreword to my first book that was coming out that year. And I remember listening to him as a journalist, and he told me how he began to rebel against his own profession because they could manufacture news, distort reality, and get the masses to read ideas that they wanted them to receive. That's why he says the lie stuck like a fishbone in the throat of the handheld microphone. So much goes on in the media world today and in the political world and probably much else where distortions and untruths are pummeled into your mind and mine and we are asked to take it to be true. But Muggeridge went on to make this comment. Listen very carefully, please, because this deals with relevance. In this sargasso sea of fantasy and fraud, how can I or anyone else hope to swim unencumbered? How can we learn to see through and not with the eye? How do I take off my own motley and wash away my own makeup? How do I raise the iron shutter and put out the studio lights, silence the sound effects and put the cameras to sleep? May I ever watch the sunrise on Sunset Boulevard and set over Forest Lawn? Can I find furniture in the studio props, silence in a discotheque, love in a striptease, read truth of an auto cue, catch it on a screen or chase it on the wings of Muzak? Can I view it in living color with the news, hear it in living sound along the motorways? No, not in the wind that rent the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks, not in the earthquake that followed, nor in the fire that followed the earthquake, but in a still small voice, not in the screeching of tires either, or in the grinding of brakes, or the roar of jets, or the whistle of sirens, not in the howl of trombones, the rattle of drums, or the chanting of demo voices. Again and again and again, I long to hear that still small voice, if I could only catch it, the voice of God. And he finally did. You see, truth on all things matters, but it matters most of all about why you and I are here in the first place. What does living really mean? What do you and I have to speak of the meaning and purpose in life? Lee Iacocca said in years ago, here am I in the twilight years of my life, still trying to figure out what this is all about. I just want you to know that fame and fortune, said he, are for the birds. Jack Higgins, who wrote The Eagle Has Landed, was interviewed and asked, what is it you now know that you did not know as a young man? He said, I know this. I wished I'd known as a young man what I know now, that when you get to the top, there's nothing there. You look at the tragic life of a genius in Ernest Hemingway and how he finally snuffed his whole life out, struggling to express physically even his sensual longing and unable to do it and confessing that it was leaving him an emotional cripple when even his body could not respond to what his mind and emotions were really calling for. And so I say to you, it is vitally important for you as a student to answer the question, what does living really mean? Why is it here? Why are we here? Do we end up like Camus, who ends up saying that the loneliest moment in life is when you have just experienced that which you thought would deliver the ultimate, and it has let you down? Ironic that Sartre, Camus, Oscar Wilde, so many thinkers who wrote in drama and the arts ended up struggling in the final moments of their lives, asking what the purpose was really all about. Jesus made that audacious claim, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, no one comes unto the Father except through me. 
Standing before Pontius Pilate, he said, they that are on the side of truth, listen to me. Pilate said, what is truth? And walked away, never waited for the answer. Why is Jesus the truth? Abdu has hinted at a couple of them. May I give you at least one or two more? He is the truth because he is the only one that I know has truly diagnosed the human heart the way it really is. The human heart the way it really is. My life was changed when I was in my 20s and I went to Vietnam. No, I didn't go to fight the war. I went there as a chaplain's assistant. I was a student in Toronto, Canada at that time. And I asked if I could go and I was invited to speak to the American troops. I remember seeing death and destruction and so many young minds having no idea why they were even there the savagery that had gone on. I visited a military hospital where they were two to a bed unless you had burns in your body. I remember watching so much of destruction and warfare that I left there and went to, went to Singapore after four months. And I walked the streets of Singapore the first night just about all night long. I walked and walked and walked, smelling and breathing in free air for the first time. And I said, God, what are we doing to ourselves as human beings, treating each other as, as animals? And then in 1980, for the first time, I went to Auschwitz and I saw what havoc had been wreaked under the aegis of the Third Reich. And I saw a statement by Hitler just outside the gas ovens. I want to raise a generation of young people devoid of a conscience, imperious, relentless, and cruel. In Auschwitz alone, they were eliminating them at the rate of 12,000 every day. The human heart is desperately wicked. You and I are capable of extraordinary things. But here is the thing. What Jesus Christ offers is so unique in worldviews. We call it the new birth. It is a miracle. We call it the new birth because it changes the desire, changes the hunger, and changes what is it you really want. I would never have believed it as a non-theist going to my 17th year of life when I cared not for any religion in India which has 330 million gods in the pantheon of Hinduism. All of the major religions in the world, and if India had not separated from Pakistan, they would also be the largest Islamic nation in the world. We are steeped in religious ideas in India. All of the major religions of the world represent that. I, did, I was fed up of all of them, had no interest. I'd certainly never opened a Bible. I don't even know if he had one in the house. But there I was at the age of 17, having tried to take my own life because I had no meaning. I had no meaning. I had to admit it. And in that hospital room at the age of 17, a Bible was brought to me and given to me. I couldn't hold it. My body was dehydrated. And the man who brought it wanted to read it to me. My mother said, I don't even know how you come in here. My son's dying. He said, Madam, he needs this more than anything else. She said, leave it with me. And he opened it to John chapter 14, where Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. My mother, with her stuttering English in the King James Version, started to read it to me. And then these words, because I live, you also shall live. I turned my life over to Christ. My father would tell you if he were alive today, he would never believe what happened to his son and never would have believed what ultimately happened to him. Christ is the transformer of the human heart. He changes us from our derelictness to give us new hungers, to give us new hope, to give us new meaning. I would not be doing this now as a 70 year old around this world if I didn't truly believe that Jesus Christ not only describes your heart, but offers the cure for your malady and changes that heart, changes the hungers. And so, you know, I close with this. <clears throat> Songwriters say it best. Philosophers can climb the ladder of abstraction. Theorists can use words. Songwriters tell it like it is. That's why Andrew Fletcher, the Scottish songwriter, a fellow, a political theorist said, let me write the songs of a nation. I don't care who writes its laws. Here's one from the Moody Blues in the 70s. Cat's foot, iron claw, neurosurgeon, scream for more from paranoia's poison door, 21st century schizoid man, blood rack, barbed wire,
politician's funeral profile. I'm sorry, that's not Moody Blues. I've got another one coming in Moody Blues. You know who I think this was uh, King Crimson. Cat's foot, iron claw, neurosurgeons scream for more from paranoia, poison door, 21st century schizoid man. Blood rack, barbed wire, politician's funeral pyre, innocent rape with napalm fire, 21st century schizoid man. Death seed, blind man's greed, poet starving, children bleed, nothing he's got he really needs, 21st century schizoid man. The walls on which the prophets wrote is cracking at the seams. Upon the instruments of death the sunlight brightly gleams, for no one lay the laurel wreath as silence drowns the screams. Between the iron gates of faith the seeds of time are sown, watered by the deeds of those who know and who are known. Knowledge is a deadly friend when no one sets the rules. The fate of all mankind, I see, is in the hands of fools. Confusion will be my epitaph as I crawl a cracked and broken path. If we make it, we can all sit back and laugh. But I'm afraid tomorrow I'll be crying. Moody Blues sang this one. Why do we never get an answer when we are knocking at the door with a thousand million questions about hate and death and war? Because when we stop and look around us, there's nothing that we need in a world of persecution that is whirling in its greed. Why do we never get an answer when we are knocking at the door? And then it ends with these two lines. I'm looking for someone to change my life. I'm looking for a miracle in my life. To you here at this great university of Michigan State, we are here to answer your questions on why we believe Jesus Christ is the one who brings that miracle and brings that change in your heart for greater things and purer objectives and the ultimate purpose for which God has fashioned you. His word is truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you for giving us both a hearing. May God bless you. We thank our two speakers again. So challenging to think about the purpose of life and, and truth. And uh, we're going to transition to our Q&A time. We have two microphones down front here. If you have a question and you came here wanting to ask a question, I'd invite you to head up to the mic. Um, since time is limited, uh, I'm going to give you a few priorities of people we'd like to prioritize uh, for the questions. So first, we'd like to reserve this time for students. Uh, and there's two mics, so you guys could head over there. Uh, second, we'd really like to prioritize this time for people who are not Christian or who are uh, unsure of their faith. Uh, we'd like to ask that you would ask uh, and versus making a statement. Try to keep the question brief so that they have time to answer the question. And finally, there are going to be two women down by the mic. They are there to help us with the priorities uh, so that we could uh, yeah, stick with these things that we're prioritizing. So it looks like we have a good crowd already. Uh, so while people are uh, getting set up there at the mics, I just want to draw your attention again to the card in the back of your program. Uh, there are spaces on there for questions. Uh, you can request information, but if, if you have a question and you write it down, someone, if you're a student, someone from a student group will get back to you. If you're in a church, someone from a church will get back to you. Uh, but you can write your question down and, and someone will get back to you and continue to engage uh, with you. So are we ready with any of the questions here? Yep, okay. We'll okay. start over here. Dr. Zacharias and Dr. Murray. Dr. Murray, Bob thank you for coming to Michigan State. I'm a, I'm a big fan of you guys. I love listening to your um, speak, speaking thank events. You. Uh, my question is, from what I've learned from the Bible, it seems to me that the mere purpose of our existence is to worship God. Even the first commandment states that thou shalt not worship any false gods before me. These characteristics exhibited by the Abrahamic God describe a self-important, jealous, and invasive being. We see them exhibited by human beings on a daily basis and reject them. If this God does exist, why would you want to worship and submit 
before such a malevolent being. Hmm. That's a, wow, that's a very, very well-worded question. Thank you much for that. Um, the idea of worshiping God seems to be this like, sort of petty thing, like if he commands you to worship him, then that's sort of petty, and why would you do something like that? Is, is that sort of the gist of the question, essentially? Oh, no, um, my question is, is that, to me, God seems very jealous and very um, narcissistic, okay. um, based on what I've read from the Bible, right. and why would you want to worship someone if he does exist? Right. Um, you know, when you think about the idea of what worship actually is, what worship is is giving someone their due uh, in this sense. Now, there's only one person to whom that is due because, like all of us, um, you and I are all imperfect. So there's no one to whom you can say that you are worthy of this kind of a thing. That's actually the, 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 the etymology of the word worship is to give someone their worthship. What are they worth? Now, if you think about the, the being who would exist as the all-powerful, omniscient, um, uh, omnipresent creator of the universe who gives you and I the life that we have, there's kind of no one else to whom you would give their worship to. So he's actually got what he's got coming to him, and he asks you for that worship. Now, what is the idea of worship, though? This is the issue. Um, when he, God's not saying, just bow down and tell me how great I am because I have some ego trip. I need you to tell me how great I am because I'm a little bit insecure, like a narcissist would be. What worship actually is, is communication and communion with God. There's that sense of thankfulness. There's that sense of adoration that you give to God. There's also a confession of sin and that sense that you have to actually ask him for things in your life. That's the act of worship all, uh, in all encompassing ways. The Christian doesn't just worship God in saying, God, you're great, God, you're great, God, you're great, almost like a mantra. A Christian actually worships God in all aspects of his or her life. You're supposed to worship God in the way you do things. In fact, the Bible actually says, Paul says, that you do all things as unto God. That includes eating and drinking. And it was A.W. Tozer who said, if these simple acts that we share with the beasts of the earth are offerings unto God, like eating and drinking, it's hard to think of anything that isn't an offering unto God. That we, we worship him in all we do, and all we do, to his glory, and to show the, the world this is how we were made. Now I want to back up and say, why do we do that? You know, and this goes back to a thing that's very important to me. Because I didn't used to be a Trinitarian. I used to be a Unitarian. I thought that God was one in his nature and one in his person. But I became a believer in the triune God. What the triune God tells me is many, many things. One of my favorite subjects to talk about is the Trinity itself. But what it tells me is this, is that there is one being who exists as one in his nature, one what, with three distinct personhoods, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and they exist in perfect community with each other. The Bible says that God is love, not that God is loving, but that God himself is love. That makes sense in light of the Trinity because Father, Son, Holy Spirit exists in perfect love with each other from eternity, so he defines love. So why does he create you and me not because he's lonely, not because he needs somebody else to tell him how great he is. He doesn't ha need that. He has that within himself, that sense of community. So why does he create you and create me? We're just going to do it imperfectly. If the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit love in perfect relationship, you and I come along to mess everything up. So why create you and create me? I think the reason is this. God doesn't create you and create me so that he can have relationship. He creates you and me so that we can have it because he doesn't need it, but he creates you and me so that we can have that sense of connectedness with the creator, because you don't just bear the, the, the moniker of slave and servant to God, you actually bear not only that sense of gratitude and servitude to God, in the, but not in a slavish way, you bear that imago Dei, which says that there is something of God that is imprinted on you. You're not God-like, but there's something about you distinct from deer, distinct from fungus, distinct from these things, there's something about you that actually reflects the Imago Dei. And so you're worshiping God for having created you in the first place so that you can have communion with him. The Westminster Shorter Catechism actually says the chief end of man is to glorify God and delight in his presence forever. Why is that the case? You glorify God for giving you the opportunity to delight in his presence forever. You're a relational being. Everyone in this room wants, has, covets, mourns the loss of relationships. We are incurably relational. And the reason that is the case is because as the effect, you reflect the cause. And the cause, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, defines relationship. 
She explains why you want it so badly. And God says the way to get that relationship is through that act of worship where you and I commune, he says, because you are expressing the deepest longing of your heart, which is to be connected to the source and the definer of life. That's what worship is. It's not this narcissistic thing where God gets some kind of gratification because be told how great he is. He gives you the privilege of actually communicating with him. He could not do that if he wanted to, but because he is who he is, he offers you that privilege. It's not narcissism for his sake. It's a gift for yours. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you for that question. And I think the first part of it was that contingent reality of God is a jealous God. And if he does exist, why would you want, why would I even want to worship him? Let me put it this way. I jokingly commented about the fact that, you know, here we are in 2017. I was married in 1972, 45 years ago. What would my marriage have been like if I went back home after the first week and went and told my wife, you know, uh, I just want you to know I spent the night with another woman tonight. I hope that's okay. And she'll say, oh, boys will be boys. You know, it's okay. I don't, I don't worry about these things. I take it in stride. It doesn't bother me one bit. And you went on and on like that over a period of life-long marriage. What would you think your love is really like or her love is really like? I remember reading the biography some years ago when I was writing a book on why Jesus uh, one of the biographies I'd read was, uh, interestingly, of all people, was of Oprah Winfrey and why she struggled with her concept of God. And when you read Oprah's story, she said she turned her back upon God when she heard the pa her pastor preach the sermon and that God is a jealous God. And that was all she needed to hear, and she had no more interest in this God. You know, there's a nuance in this question that's very serious. I won't go into that now. And the nuance is that how can there be such evil as a reality and then ask me to worship at the same time? But I won't move in that direction. What I will say to you is this. There is no such thing as free love. There's no such thing as free love. It's a black and white contradiction in two words. In the old English marital ceremony, when you pledged yourself to your spouse, the line that is there for many, many decades said this, with my body, I thee worship. What that really means is there's an exclusivity to our physical consummation, which will not be profaned in a relationship with anybody else. There's a sacredness of that physical consummation and any other th expression with compromise it would be a profanation. And so marriage has that sacred consummate bond. And that which is true of physical union in man and wife in marriage is seen as a sacred communion in worship, spirit to spirit, where God in his spirit indwells within us. The profanation of that relationship is a violation of what Jesus describes this body, and it's the only worldview in which the body is referred to as the temple of the living God. God makes this his residence. So my relationship to God is a sacred relationship, and that jealousy means that a rupture of that relationship, you cannot bring the sacredness and the profanation of it at the same time. One has to go. Either you give up the sacredness and you've abandoned God, or you give up the profaning and you are totally committed to the living God. But beyond that, you have to say it's this, God does this for our own benefit. If you really want to enjoy sexual relationship with your spouse, you dare not profane it. The sacredness of that is what God has given to you and to me for our protection. So if you take one statement like God is a jealous God and think that sums up all there is of God, you've missed so much more there is about who God is. And so the woman comes taken in adultery and Jesus looks at them and says, where are your accusers? And he lifts her up and gives her back her feet to walk in dignity. The woman with the alabaster ointment who had probably got that through her profane living comes and pours that alabaster ointment and the big religious one said, if only he knew who was making contact with him, he would never have accepted it. And he looked at those men and said, do you know who this is? 
if a person is forgiven 50 or a person is given 500, who will love more? They said, oh, a person is forgiven 500. He said, you're looking at her. So the forgiving grace of God is so rich in its splendor to just take one description of him being a jealous God and say, why would I want to worship him, is to miss the grandeur and splendor and the heart of mercy that God actually has for the wayward child. And when you learn to worship him in spirit and in truth, it's the only way to find coherence of what really brings life's purpose and meaning together. So don't take that one statement to think that's the sum and substance of who God is. He is much more than any single statement can describe him in those terms. That's my answer to you. Thank you. Uh, Hello. Um, so my name is Dylan, and I wouldn't say that I'm an atheist. I would say that I'm an agnostic. I'm currently, I guess you could say, on the fence. And I have been pondering the question of religion for uh, a very long time, the existence of God. I was born into a Muslim family. I became an atheist in high school, and I did watch many of your videos. I do have a lot of, a tremendous amount of respect for you. Um, and I want to thank you for, uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for everything that you've done. Uh, my question is, how does God view people that want God to exist, that believe that there is something fun fundamentally wrong with the human heart, that believe that Jesus has accurately diagnosed the problems with the human heart, but cannot bring themselves to believe in him, that cannot feel his presence? How do we fit into the context of Christianity? How does God view people like us? Mm. Yeah. I'll go first as a non-theist, or more, I think that's why I try to say it, not so much I was against God as much as I had no room for God. And Abdul comes, as you well know, from a Muslim background. I'll let him tackle that little part of it for you personally. First, let me thank you. What you have said, you have said with such respect and such kindness and such candor. And I wish more and more people in the world would learn to deal with such profound issues with respect, even if we end up disagreeing. So thank you, sir, for the courtesy with which you have done this. You know, I asked myself this question many, many times. We did Arizona State yesterday and then uh, last week and then yesterday. University of Michigan, today Michigan State, next week Indiana University, immediately after that I'm on to New Zealand and then to Malaysia, and the time goes on, and the body gets beaten up. And while I was driving here, somebody said to me, how do you feel? I said, really emotionally weary and physically weary. Why then am I here? Why then am I here? Because I firmly believe in responding to men and women like yourself. The question you have asked is life-defining. I can only say to you, when you come to the living God and say, I want to believe, but I really cannot find enough of that credibility in what it is you claim to say, you are the truth, you are the way, and you are the life. I respect that fully. In fact, one, once one person, a young man in Washington once said to me, why has God made it so difficult to believe in him? And I think it's a very real statement of struggle. And theologians call this the hiddenness of God. Let me start off with this. Life is always an interplay between faith and reason. It's always an interplay between faith and reason. The scientist who thinks he or she is living purely by reason does not realize they have faith in the very methodology and the reasonableness of their pursuit. It's always an interplay between faith and reason. Now, suppose you had a God who would reveal himself at every turn in the road. Jesus, come through the ceiling right now and reveal yourself to me. What if he did this? Then you walk out of this building and you see somebody who's been hit by a car and a leg has been lost. What are you going to say? Jesus, why don't you replace that leg? And then you, you, all right, God does that. Then you go back home and you find your house has been burned down. And you say, Jesus, why don't you put my house back together? Why, are all these, why did all this burning take place? You see, you end up really playing God. 
You end up becoming God, not for who God is, but how you and I can control him. It's like a slot machine. Say the right mantra and the answers come. Ask for the solution and ABCD comes out in a printed sheet of paper. The interplay between faith and reason is not fideism, which faith alone, nor sheer rationalism apart from faith. You interplay, God has put enough into this world to make faith in him a most reasonable thing, but he's left enough out to make it impossible to live by sheer reason alone. He's put enough into this world to make faith in him a most reasonable thing, left enough out to make it impossible to live by sheer reason alone. Just before I came here, I was rereading an article by A.N. Wilson, the famed writer who debunked the writings of C.S. Lewis and went so far as to say, reading mere Christianity made an atheist out of him. He said he became a strident atheist. He said, I would call it my Damascus Road experience against God. He lived out his atheism, and the years went by, and he found it was the most incoherent presuppositions he had ever brought together. He said, my Damascus Road experience into atheism was dramatic. My return to God was a slow process of questioning and doubting and questioning and doubting. And he was sitting in a church on Easter Sunday, and he said, this is it. If Jesus really rose again from the dead, this then is my answer, and he began that pursuit. I want to just tell you two things as a man who has struggled with two faiths, and it is this. Number one, if Jesus were a charlatan and a hooligan, you know what he would have said? Put me on a cross and I will spiritually rise again. How would you falsify that? Couldn't falsify it. I will spiritually rise. He didn't do that. He said, you kill this body and I will bodily rise again. All that the skeptics of the day had to do was present his body and that would have been the death knell of Christendom. It would never have gone beyond that day. He gave the tangible evidence of that which could have been falsified had it not been so. But then there's the second thing. If you go through your own previous belief that led you into atheism, finally, I want to say this to you. Every worldview, Every worldview, except for the Judeo-Christian worldview, every worldview, you earn your salvation. You earn it. Your right, dis right deeds have to outweigh your bad deeds. Your karma has to be good karma versus bad karma. When you look at the person of Jesus Christ, his grace and his forgiveness is offered as a gift. Last night, when I was speaking at in the University of Michigan, I told them this story. Years ago, I was in Damascus, and the chief Shia cleric, Sheikh Hussein, asked for a dialogue with me, and we had a three-hour dialogue. He sat between, the, the interpreter sat between him and me, and a crowd of people listening in. Very fine gentlemen. I wish we could talk more often to people of counter-perspectives. He would ask me a question about my faith, I would answer it. I would ask him a question on his faith, he would answer it. Finally, before it was over, he said to me, Professor, I want to say something to you before this evening is over. It is this. He said, maybe it's time for those in my belief to stop asking if Jesus Christ died on the cross and to start asking why. When you have the answer to that, you will know he died for you to change your heart, to show you his love and give you the purpose and meaning for which he has made you. Augustine said he has made us for himself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in him. Seek after him. Pursue him. Ask him to reveal himself to you. Take the Gospel of John. Read it and write beside it your questions. And if you would, I would be happy to stay in touch with you. Meet one of my colleagues afterwards, and I would be happy to walk in this journey with you and look forward to the day where you stand up in the same audience, maybe here or somewhere else, and say, I have found the answer to the hunger of my heart. God has answered my prayer. It's my answer to you. Thank you. Uh, hi. Thank you for coming and speaking with us. Uh, I'm an atheist. So in response to my question, I ask that you appeal not to the Bible, as I, I have come to the conclusion that it's not evidence in itself. Uh, I'm, I'm asking for evidence to validate the Bible and a belief in God. So 
Uh, just, just please keep that in mind in your answer. Uh, now, purpose is a question that arises as a result of human egoism, the desire for a validation of one's actions. Now, you've cited God as the answer to the question of purpose, but can you necessitate the question itself? Uh, can you cite evidence of purpose beyond the evolutionary drive to live? Say the last part again, I'm sorry? Uh, can you cite evidence of a purpose in life beyond the evolutionary drive to live? Beyond the evidence of our, and I'm sorry, I'm just having a little bit of echo. We're not hearing the last statement, beyond very, what to live? Beyond no. the evolutionary drive to live. Beyond the evolutionary drive to live. Yes. Oh, I see. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> I'll give it a bit of a shot and then I'll uh, leave it to uh, wiser minds to, uh, to uh, respond as well. Um, uh, <clears throat> thanks very much for the question. I think it's a great question. Um, when you look at some of the, 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 the biggest philosophers in life, when they ask, the, the issues of purpose, and even the atheist philosophers are talking about purpose. We have this inner strive for it. Now, one might say, well, that's an evolutionary drive for purpose. I would beg to differ on this because evolutionary drives for, for, for purpose, by, by definition, if it's got a survival characteristic, it was conducive to the species so that it survives and thrives in some way. So what you have to do is take an evolutionary drive, figure out what that would be, why we, desi we, we ask questions like, what are the two moons on Mars? What are, their, you know, what are they shaped like? Why does the sun um, uh, have a sort of uh, a, a, a spin of itself? What magnetic fields does it create? All these things. You know what doesn't ask these questions? Lions. Uh, they're irrelevant to the survivability of that particular species. So we don't ask questions that are just like, how can I make a better you know, bird cage to, ca to capture the food? How can I do these things? What we ask is questions like, why? In fact, Dawkins said that why questions are meaningless, yet we persist in asking them. So on an evolutionary paradigm, if what we do is constantly look for things that help us to survive and to find the right mates and all these things, the question we have to ask, haha, the why question, is why do we do that? It serves no evolutionary purpose. For example, when, if you look at the way the, the, the Earth is actually situated, our solar system uh, is situated within the galaxy of the Milky Way, in between the armbands of the Milky Way galaxy. If we were in the armbands, the sky would be white. We'd be unable to see anything. If we were too close to the center, we would either be destroyed by the radiation or whatever else might be. We are in exactly the right spot so we can explore the universe. And we begin to look out there and look around. This doesn't help us at all. There's no evolutionary drive for us to ask questions no one's actually answering or actually cares to answer on an evolutionary drive. So we look for purpose. We look for a place in the universe. And if we do that, and it serves no evolutionary purpose, and evolutionary, evolutionary purposes drive all of our decisions, then it seems to be an anomaly. Now you could say, well, we'll figure out one of those things. And that's one of the problems. If you look at a, a book by an atheist, by the way, I would appeal to you to look at a book by an atheist. Two books I would recommend to you. The first one is called Mind and Cosmos by Thomas Nagel, one of our finest philosophers in the United States. He wrote a book called Mind and Cosmos, where he tries to explain why human beings have a consciousness that asks why questions, why there's morality. He says the naturalistic evolutionary processes that explain these things are not valid. They just don't add up. Follow up to him is a scientist who's both a Darwinist and a neuroscientist, and he says what he calls neuromania. Neuromania is the, 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 the drive to explain everything through the, con the configuration of your, your neurons. And Darwinitis, the, the quest to explain everything that we do through Darwinism. He takes these two things apart. He says, look, I'm a neuroscientist. I believe in neuroscience. I'm a Darwinist. I believe in, evo I, I ascribe to evolution. But these two things, in principle, can't actually explain why you are more than a gifted chimp. You're more than that. Because you ask the why questions, evolution doesn't actually explain it. They've tried to do it over and over again, and all it does, as Raymond Tallis, who wrote that book, Aping Mankind, says, all that is is ad hoc. You're trying to create an evolutionary purpose because you believe evolutionary purposes explain everything. If they explain everything, they'll explain this. It's tautological. Evolution explains everything. This needs to be explained. Therefore, evolution explains it. But it doesn't explain it as many have, have pointed out. So when the Bible says, and I'm gonna not quote the Bible, but when the Bible says, you are looking for a purpose, and there's something that's grander outside of you, we have to ask ourselves, why do we ask those things? Why do we look for those things? There's no evolutionary purpose that can be ascribed to why you care what the rings of Saturn are made of. There's no evolutionary purpose to, to that. But 
what the Bible does say, and I will quote it back to you only because I think it actually does corroborate what I'm saying. In Proverbs 25, verse 2, it makes this amazing statement, because oftentimes I think religion is seen as a science stopper, not a science inspirer. I think it's quite the opposite. In Proverbs 25, verse 2, it says, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It is the glory of kings to search them out. Now, why is that? Why do we look for these things we can't see that God has so, so almost hidden from us, that we takes an intelligence and a, and, a, and a desire to find these things? Because we delight in the discovery. When my son, he had one of these little speaking spells, one of these like uh, fake laptops. It's like a Spider-Man laptop, but it's just a computer with a, it spits out words at him. It's not an actual laptop. He was, we were sitting at a kitchen table, and there he was, and he was playing on this thing. And I'm talking to my wife, and he's playing on the speaking spell, or whatever it's called, and he says, hat. He was a baby. He said, hat. I'm like, what, what in the world? And I look over there, and I see. He read the word hat. I'm like, oh my goodness. And what's the next word? He said, fat, bat, rat. Anything that, any more at words? What, 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 more words, please. I was super excited, and he was squealing with delight. You know what's interesting in that? Is that in that exchange, he was squealing in delight because of the learning that was happening. But of the two of us, the one who was more delighted was me. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter because it is the glory of kings to seek them out. He discovered something, but I as his father delighted more. I think that God puts the why questions into your and my heart, not because only so that you can delight in discovery, but so that he can delight when you discover it. Thank you. Um, so I guess I'll start off. I am a humanist, and uh, our first speaker, um, Dr. Murray, I know you said at the beginning something along the lines of how if we accept the idea of um, arguing without, like, without a god or whatever, that we will inevitably lead to violence. So I'd like to just ask, if we all agree that logic and scientific inquiry can lead to truth, how will that necessarily lead us to violence? Do you want to answer it? How will that necessarily lead Lead, lead to violence, yeah. Uh, go ahead, sorry. I didn't, uh, how will it lead, if we look for truth, how will it necessarily lead to violence? Um, not exactly. Our first speaker, Dr. Murray, was talking about uh, humanism and mentioned that we, uh, if we think along these lines, we're going to get to a state where whoever has the most physical strength is going to win oh, an argument. Okay. And I'm sorry. I, I just want to ask, if we all agree with the humanist line of thinking that we should use rational thought and scientific inquiry to try to better the human race, how exactly will that lead us to violence? A great question. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm, uh Paying attention, obviously. Um, <clears throat> I'll say this. I wasn't making the statement that it necessarily leads to violence. That's not what I was saying. That scientific inquiry and rational thought necessarily leads to violence. When I quoted Tom Flynn, what I was pointing out was that Tom Flynn actually believes in objective truth, reflective ideas, and scientific inquiry. He says, through this, we will eventually come to rough agreement concerning values. What I'm saying is he's made the statement that it necessarily will lead to this wonderful utopia we're talking about. And what I'm saying is the evidence is exactly contrary to that. When you look at the past 100 years, we have never been more educated than we are now. I just spoke from an iPad that has more computing power than the very first rocket that went to the moon. We're sitting here in this wonderful stadium that's a result of technology and all the learning we're creating, all the humanities. And so Tom Flynn says that if we do this, we'll eventually come to rough agreement concerning values. When you look around the world and say, is that really true? Now there's religious differences, but there's also non-religious differences. We have some of the most stalwart regimes that have come and exterminated life. <clears throat> as a result of their atheistic thinking, or it allowed it. I'm not saying that atheists become awful people. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that religion has been used to exploit people, and so has non-religion. It has been used to exploit people. So I wasn't saying that it necessarily follows that if you follow a humanist line of thinking, we'll be that way. What I'm saying is inevitable because of who we are, not what we do. 
and those, those things. So if we look for those things, truth and all these things, I think we can lead, go to a life where it'll be better for us. The problem is, is that I think the truth doesn't lie in how brilliant we are. I think the truth lies in how we can be redeemed because we are showing ourselves in history over and over again to not be so reliable when it comes to valuing other people. No matter what your worldview happens to be, that just happens to be the way it is. So I think that's what I would say to you is that if we pursue truth through science, if we pursue truth, pursue truth through the humanities, that'll be a wonderful thing. We need to come together as humanists, as Christians, we need to come together and understand these are valuable tools, but they're valuable tools so that human beings can flourish. But here's the thing I would say back to you. Not all of us agree that every human being should flourish. If we did, we wouldn't be where we are now. We don't agree. Whether we're religious or non-religious, we simply don't agree. Those people are different or they have what we want and if we're smarter, we'll dominate them. And by the way, let me go back to one last thing. The evolutionary paradigm is built on the idea that not everyone is equal. It's built on the idea. You have natural selection uh, uh, acting, on, uh, or, uh, uh, acting in accordance with genetic mutation, which means that the survival of the fittest means that the fittest will survive. That doesn't mean everybody. And so by definition, I think if we try to pursue these things, we're going against the evolutionary stream, not in favor of the evolutionary stream on a moral basis. So I would say to you that not everybody agrees that we're all in this together. That's one thing. But I think that if we see us as equal, see, I see you as equal because I see not your physicality, although I think that's an important part of who you are. Our physicalness doesn't make us equal because some of us are different. We're bigger, stronger, faster, smarter, dumber, you know, uh, slower, uh, more creative, whatever. We're all very different in many ways, but there is an equality that comes to us. That equality is, I believe, that because of our humanness and our fallenness, but also the fact that we can be redeemed, that creates an equality. And that never existed, by the way, in the ancient Roman Empire until the Christian message infiltrated it and changed that idea that all people are created equal because they're made in God's image. Great question. Thank you so much for letting me, let me clarify. I appreciate it. Can I, can I take a shot at it too, sir? Before you go, I think your question is so good because it was raised by an atheist in the latter part of the 1800s, and that was Nietzsche himself. And Nietzsche is the one who popularized the phrase, God is dead but he made two extensions from his belief. He said, if God has died in the 19th century, the 20th century will become the bloodiest century in history and a universal madness will break out. So it was an atheist who said that. And the reason he said that is there's gonna be no up or down. We are gonna be perpetually falling backwards and nature of course was right on both counts. He spent the last 13 years of his own life moving between sanity and insanity and uh, the, in the 20th century, we killed more people in warfare than the previous 19 centuries put together. But your question has a very sharp point that we need to draw out, and I appreciate you asking it. These are the questions we wrestle with too, so I thank you for even asking it. And that is two assumptions that your question is making here. Number one, your question is assuming that humanism has a common ground for moral reasoning. It doesn't. There are seven different kinds of humanistic philosophies, all the way from Ayn Rand, you can go to Joseph Fletcher and various others who have their own theories of humanism. If you go back to the humanist's definition of what it means to be human, the definition of the humanist manifesto today is so different from the humanism that you go back to the times of the Renaissance. There it was man sort of glorying in all of the gifts that he was endowed with. Now the humanist manifesto goes strongly in the verbiage of silencing any transcendent motive for living. So humanism is not monolithic. It has changed its shades again and again, and today the very word progressivism comes out of the humanist manifesto. So I want to give you two illustrations of this. Joseph Stalin was a seminary student, and then he renounced his faith in God. He became so stridently anti-theistic in the name of his own humanistic philosophy that Lenin cautioned the people that there was a deadly plan that could be working in his mind. As you know, he was, his name really wasn't Stalin. He was called that because he was a man of steel, as it were. 
Muggeridge personally shared this with me, and Paul Johnson in his book, Modern Times and Other Places, has documented this. Svetlana Stalin told uh, Muggeridge that, and on the BBC narrated this event, this account. But prior to that narrating of that account, here's what happened. I mean, while he was on his deathbed, he clenched his fist at the heavens one more time, threw his head back on the pillow, and he was gone. That was his last physical gesture having obliterated 15 million of his own people. Now, here's what I want you to listen to me very, very carefully. I, it is wrong to think that humanism and atheism logically works out to a Joseph Stalin. No, but humanism and atheism lends itself to the extensions that a Joseph Stalin and a Lenin can make. What do I mean by that? A woman from overseas, a politician, came to see Stalin and looked at him and said, how long do you expect to be torturing your own people and expect them to follow you? Stalin didn't answer. He asked for a live chicken in order to be brought to him. And the live chicken was brought to him, and he started defeathering that bird. And as the chicken struggled to break free, he denuded it completely. All feathers gone, put the chicken down, picked up a piece of bread, walked a few paces and bent down like this. The chicken came and pecked away, pecked away at the bread. He said, Madam, do you have your answer? I tortured this chicken. It will follow me for food the rest of its life. People are like that chicken. You torture them and they will follow you for food the rest of their lives. I told this story at the Center for Geopolitical Strategy. The general who was sitting next to me, his lips started to quiver. He's a heavy set man, and we, my wife and I took him out for dinner that night. I saw him come to terms with ultimately giving his life to Christ. It was not that what Stalin did was the only outworking of his humanistic, atheistic worldview. It lent itself and provided the freedom to define people any way that he wanted to because it's a self-referencing definition. And the second fallacy is this. We in America have a strong belief in moral reasoning. It's one of the few countries with this hope of moral reasoning. In the humanist worldview, there is no transcendent basis for moral reasoning. And you bring together a pluralistic culture, you have to find the answer to that question. So humanism has two of the most fundamental issues that it struggles with and wrestles with. What does it mean to be human? Are we like that chicken to be tortured and followed by a food giver for the rest of our lives? What is the basis of moral reasoning? Those two questions are still answered, unanswered in the Humanist Manifesto, given a pluralistic culture. And so I think those are things you really need to think about and work through in your mind. But thank you for asking that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, All right. My apologies, but we're going to have time for one more question. Hello. Uh, thank you so much both for coming here. I, I really appreciate getting this chance to speak with you. My question is about homosexuality. I'll, I want some clarity on this. I grew up in the church. I believe I even recall when I was really little, my mom would turn on and we'd listen to you, Dr. Zacharias, on the radio. Mm -hmm. I thought that was pretty neat. Um, My apologies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I have a general base, at least, as to what the Bible says about homosexuality. And I, uh, and in the past several years, I've heard arguments saying that in the Old Testament, in, say, Leviticus, that's no longer valid. And in the New Testament, that the descriptions of what are considered homosexuality and what are considered sin are too vague for us to understand from the uh, interpretation or this, that, or the other thing. And I truly want clarity because this has been something that I've been split with. I grew up saying that homosexuality has always been sin, and as I continue, I keep seeing that no, it's not, and it's tearing me apart, please. Thanks very much for the, uh, I think, very, very thoughtful question. I think that's where the silence in the room, this is everyone wants to know, what are we going to say next? <laughs> I'd like to know the same thing, by the way. Um, you know, that question was asked of me. I was uh, at another open forum at another university in a state. I'll just leave unnamed for now. 
Um, and someone had walked up to the microphone and she was actually trembling when she asked the question uh, because um, she wanted to know the answer. She said, I want to know what does the Bible have to say about sexuality, specifically homosexuality and other uh, uh, things that people struggle with. You know, when you look at someone like that and someone like you who's asking a sincere question, seeking for clarity, uh, it's a refreshing way to look at it because nowadays, as already been said, is that if differing views is uh, subscribe to the Hitlerization of other people. I want to assume the best in someone who disagrees with me. I want to assume they agree with me out of, born out of an idea of love. I want to assume that when I say something, they ho I hope that they assume of me that I'm saying it out of an uh, idea of love. So we can disagree sharply on these things, but oftentimes we do it so disagreeably that we bring only heat and no light. So what I want to say to you, I want to say very, very carefully, because this is a question I'm sure not only you are asking. So when, I, when she came up to the microphone and she asked this question, uh, my friends and I were sort of ask, uh, doing, going seriatim with the questions. And so he would ask a question, he would answer a question, then me, and then, you know, that kind of thing. And it happened to be my turn. And I, was, I gulped hard and he said, you're up, big guy. And there I was at the microphone. <clears throat> you know, there's only so many worldviews to choose from when it comes to this question. You can take a nihilistic approach, in which case the question you just asked is basically meaningless. Uh, you can take uh, an atheistic approach or a secular approach that just views things uh, as Richard Dawkins says, we are machines for propagating DNA. It is every living object's sole reason for living. That's what he says. I'm not making that up. That's what he said. And then he also says, you can't help but feel sorry for someone who is sterile, who can't actually contribute to the gene pool. That is a, something you have to feel sorry for. So clearly, the idea of the propagation of the species is important in terms of our actions and all these things. So I said to her, if you're going to actually look for a worldview, only so many to choose from, to validate what you want to be true. And the question is, is it something that you want to be true or something that you're willing to ascribe to, even if it's not conforming to your preferences? So propagation of DNA is everything there is to have. And if that's the case, then the behavior of homosexuality is unevolutionary. And you can kind of come up with uh, other ideas about how it might benefit the species, but again, we're kind of ad hoc on that. We're just guessing. Uh, but it seems unevolutionary. So that won't necessarily help you. Then you look to the pantheistic cultures where there's a, highly, uh, there's, there's a very a strain of sexual um, sort of uh, ethos in some of those religious uh, expressions. But ultimately, if you look at the news systems, by the way, there was a, um, uh, when one of the uh, royal family of India came out as homosexual, his mother actually put out an ad that said, I will sue you, I will bring legal action against you if you say this is my son. And they were burning images of him, of him in effigy. So there you might not find the validation either. I'm not saying everyone from that system is like that. I'm just saying you can't retreat to someone and say, oh, that's automatically in favor of what I said. In some Islamic countries, you couldn't even ask the question that you just did it in public. Um, that's just the way it is. Not in every place, but that's how it works. So you don't find a lot of answers there in those ways. But can I answer this? And I asked her this question. Can I give you a statement about why the Bible says what it says? And this goes back to what I was talking about, about the Imago Dei. See, I think oftentimes Christians are so enamored with the institution of marriage or the idea of sexuality as an institution that we forget there's people involved. And we think that the Bible has these strictures and these boundaries that exist solely for the idea that, well, we don't like that behavior, it's icky, so stone people for doing it, as if it's arbitrary and these kind of things. Rather than seeing the possibility that maybe the Bible isn't pro-institution, it's actually pro-people. It's actually saying things that it believes, that it, that it espouses, that are actually in favor of someone and in, in, in being made in God's image. So the Bible first starts with that. It says you're not a DNA propagator. You know, you didn't wake up this morning and none of you, I think, woke up this morning, looked in the mirror and said, I am a very well-dressed DNA propagator. I think you think of yourself as more than that, something more to you than that. That's why those who are struggling with these, with, with these uh, wrestling with these issues always say, just people, let people love who they want because love is something that's not just a physical thing. It's actually got a spiritual component to it. So I think we're all agreeing at least to some degree on that. But you are made in God's image. And this is what I told her. The Bible tells me and tells you that you are made in God's image. So regardless of your uh, preferences, regardless of your attractions, regardless of your beliefs, the image of God on you simply says that you are a human being who has the ability to relate both on the vertical and in the horizontal level. So regardless of what you believe, you are made there. I, as a Christian, believe that I and you are both sinners. So I can never look at you and say, you're less than me. 
A Christian has no right to do that to anybody. And I would never say that to her. I might not agree with behavior because of certain prescriptions I find that are in, I think, the vouchsafed word of God. But I can never say that the person is worse than me or better than me or whatever it might be. We're, we have an Arabic phrase, kul nafil hawasawa. It literally means we're all in the same air or we're all in the same wind. The connotation is we all smell the same stink. We have more colorful phrases than Americans do. We're all in the same boat. We're all in the same stink. It's a little more colorful. Um, so we're all in this together. There's an equality that happens there just by fact of our, of our essence as human beings. I said, that's something that God wants to about safe. What is the sexual act? The sexual act has many components to it, but one of those components is that it's the bringing together of two people for the purpose of creating another being beautifully made in God's image as, I, as she is, I told her. As you are, the sex act brings together two people to create another beautiful being in, your, in God's image, just like you. So the act is sacred because the result is sacred. Because that girl who asked me that question, and everyone in this room, you're not incidentally sacred, you are intrinsically sacred. And so is she. And sex is the act by which that happens. So it needs, the sacred needs protecting. It needs to be nurtured and made sure that it doesn't become common. Because if sex is whatever you feel like that day, whatever you feel strongly even in your own heart, and it becomes whatever you want, it stops being sacred and starts being common. And God doesn't want that for any one of us, for sex to be common. We were at an open forum actually where our colleague Sam Albury, who's written an excellent book that I would suggest everybody in this room get, is God anti-gay. Someone who actually has same-sex attractions, by the way, and is a believer is God anti-gay. I highly recommend you get this book. And someone asked him, what is sex, what is intimacy? And he said, you can have a whole lot of sex with no intimacy and a whole lot of intimacy with no sex. And then his counterpart was asked, what's the question during the same question during the dialogue? And she said, it depends on whom I'm having sex with that day. See, the sacred sense of it and the common sense of it, it's just common. And I don't think this girl was asking because she thought it was common. She viewed it as sacred in and of itself. So the first part is this, that the sexual act brings is sacred because the result is sacred, because a person is created, a human being made in God's image. But what is sex as well within the bonds of marriage is that it, what it is, is the unities of diversities, a man and a woman. Everyone in this room knows how biologically different men and women are. Just get married and you'll find out how psychologically different they actually are. <laughs> but it's a unity of diversities. Why is that important? Because God himself is a unity of diversities. As I already explained, one God in three persons, he is the creator, and the marriage act reflects something of that creator. Again, God wants you to reflect that splendor in the marriage act of unities of diversities. Jesus was asked a question about marriage, and he says, did you not read in the beginning that in his image he created them? Male and female, he created them. In his image, he created them. He was talking to Jews when he said this. They know the story. They know who the them is. But Jesus went out of his way to point out male and female, he created them. A male is sacred in his maleness. A female is sacred in her femaleness. And they ought not to be interchanged as one for the other. Because I am benefited in some way because someone who's not like me, but equally sacred and made in God's image, contributes something and someone who is not like her also. We don't exchange each other out for someone just like us because of unity and diversity. And then finally, from the Bible's perspective, and there's many other things that can be said about this, many, many other things that can be said about this. What you have at the end of the world is not judgment only. There is a judgment that's coming, but the Bible doesn't describe the end as a judgment. The Bible describes the end as a marriage. That those who are redeemed, who are once steeped in these things, get redeemed, and they marry this, this, this finite, once dirty, very self-seeking body of people who now get redeemed to become those who seek after God and who clean up their life and who God has cleaned up their life for them. This finite, limited, sinful, but redeemed bride marries God who is eternal, 
pure of heart and self-giving. There's a unity of diversities right there. Marriage is a reflection of unities of diversities. And I would never want, the reason why the Bible says this is why the sex act is what it is, is because the Bible wants that reflection in each one of us. That is a beautiful thing that God wants to protect in every person. And I said to her, he wants that for you. You can choose to reject it if you want, but he wants that for you. That beauty, that sacredness. It's difficult to deal with on a personal level because we want preferences or we have strong inclinations. And I would never tell somebody, I understand what you're going through when it comes to that. I have my own issues to deal with. I don't need to get in somebody else's head. I have my own preferences and my own things that I have to deal with uh, and uh, that go against, I think, the, the, the absolute truth, the objective truth. But this is somebody who has something that I can't understand and I would never deign to say I understand. But I know what the Bible says and it's not pro-institution, it's for her. It's in favor of her. And there she was, and she was crying her eyes out at the end. And we prayed together. It was not the end of the conversation, not by a long shot. But at least she saw that I didn't believe something because I thought she was icky. I believed something because God sees her as beautiful. <clears throat> and we will, we will close. I'll make a comment here, and then just a closing word or so. First of all, I want to thank the students here, and the leadership and the administration of Michigan State. The fact that they have allowed us the use of this beautiful facility to have a dialogue on matters so serious is an example to the rest of the universities of this country, how you can meet on very deeply significant issues and have the privilege of using a facility like this. So on behalf of our team, I want to say thanks to your university. You know, people ask me often, how have the questions changed over 40 years of crisscrossing over the globe? Well, one of the ways the questions have changed is on these very meaningful and significant social issues, because it strikes deep into the soul of a person's privilege and prerogative. I've often looked at the scriptures and asked myself the question, it would be nice if Jesus were a little more specific on the answers to these issues that we face, how to even answer them. So let me take a step back and first talk about this sociologically and then biblically and bring a close to this. There are three types of cultures in which we live as far as ethics are concerned. There is a theonomous culture, a heteronomous culture, and an autonomous culture. Theonomous cultures believe that God's law is so ingrained in our hearts that all of our choices are really a reflection of our commitment to God. And uh, we don't see cultures like that anymore. Uh, we used to call it natural law. It's not held with any fervor anywhere in the globe. If there's one that does come close, it's probably in India. They call themselves dharti ke admi, people of the soil. There is that Hindu motif and the Hindu view of life and the greeting of reverence for each other. But even that is very quite divided. It's not monolithic. There is then the heteronomous culture. Heteros meaning another, nomos meaning law, another law. In the religious world, Islam is a heteronomous culture. In the political world, Marxism is a heteronomous culture where religiously speaking, a handful of leaders and the guides above dictate the values and the behavior of the masses below. That is heteronomous, heteronomy in action, where a few, either the mullahs or the leaders or whatever on top, the sheikhs will tell you what is right and what is wrong. America is not a heteronomous culture. So we are not theonomous, we are not heteronomous. That leaves us with the third, which is autonomous, auto self nomos law. We give each other the privilege of making these choices individually and for themselves. And so here's what I say. If we are an autonomous culture, then the Christian also ought to have the privilege of making a decision and a choice on these matters, even if it sits in a discomfortable way for others. And I have to give the other perspective the right also to make their choices in an autonomous way. This is not dealing with right and wrong. This is dealing with 
how society functions in plural plurality. Now, why didn't Jesus answer these questions the way I would like him to? I would like for him to have said a lot more on many specific subjects that were evils in his day, because he very seldom dealt with symptomatic issues. He always dealt with the foundational and the fundamental issue. And the fundamental issue is not these kinds of proclivities or behaviors. The fundamental question is, do you belong to God or do you belong to yourself? And when the Christian lays his life down before God, all of his behavior, whether it's dictating and bullying people or whether it's exploiting people or cheating on your taxes or proclivities, we submit to the person of God. And so if the heart is desperately wicked and the heart is changed, then the behavior changes too. The people in Jesus' day did not appreciate the Romans. They despised the Romans because of the yoke on them. What did Jesus say to him? Next time a Roman soldier comes and tells you to carry his arms one mile, carry it one mile and look at him and say, do you mind if I carry it the second also? You see, the Christian has to live by love, by the example of kindness and graciousness, such that somebody who's even throwing his yoke upon you, his life will see the beauty of what the Christian life is, and his or her life will be changed accordingly. Let your light so shine before men that they glorify, that they see, that they see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. We are called upon to live with love and live with example. Jesus stunned his audience by telling them the story of the Good Samaritan. It was a surprise. You see, we don't think of it as the Samaritan who was good because we just say, ah, yeah, he's talking about them. But the Samaritan was marginalized in society. He was not even given to some mongrel race amongst the Samaritans. It would be like one of my colleagues saying, Today we preach the parable of the good Taliban. We don't think of the Taliban as somebody who's doing a lot of good, but we see a Taliban coming to bind up my wounds and show me by example what goodness and kindness are all about. So as a Christian, I am called upon to love people and treat them as a child or a person created image of God even if I do not completely agree or endorse their lifestyle. So I say to you, we have to learn in this society to live with each other with love and beneficence, even if we disagree with each other. We ought to be able to embrace one another and say, this is your choice. Please allow me to have mine as well. I will not be your judge, but you can make the freedom to choose. You cannot choose the consequences that is a built-in law that God gives to you and to me. I love people of various worldviews and various dispositions, but I have to learn how to not compromise my convictions and yet view with compassion every other human being, even if I agree or do not agree. Convictions with compassion is needed in our time so that we sit across a table and learn to disagree without being disagreeable. These are very significant issues, and may God have mercy and guide us through. I am commanded to love a person, even if I disagree with that person, and through my life, win that person over to the beauty of what Jesus Christ is all about. The symptoms is not where we make the judgment. The heart needs to be changed. And so I say this to you. There's an old song that talks about a man traveling through the desert, and he had all the bottles of water around his shoulder that he had consumed. He comes to a pump, and he's finally glad he's going to see water, but he lifts the handle of the pump and brings it down, but he hears metal upon metal. Then he sees a tin can around that pump, and inside the tin can is a message. And it says, don't despair, there's a lot of water in this pump, just follow the instructions. Buried under the sand is a bottle of water. It should be full. Take that bottle out. Do not drink it or you'll soon be thirsty again. 
empty it out into the cylinder of the pump and keep priming it and the suction system will start to work. Water will come gushing out. Drink all the water you want. Refill all the bottles you've got. Don't forget to fill up that one bottle and put it for the next person to come. If you don't do that, you will soon be thirsty again and so will every other passerby. You have a choice to either believe the note and follow the examples, empty the bottle out and get all the water you want, or consume that one bottle on yourself and leave yourself thirsty and everybody else thirsty. There's a parable in there. Jesus calls you to surrender your life to him and he will give you that living water. You pour your life out to him, he'll give you all the refreshment and fulfillment that he has made you for. You reject him and consume life upon yourself, you'll soon be thirsty again and so will everybody else who passes by that journey. Take your life, put it into the hands of God, and the symptomatic issues will be addressed. As a Christian, my commitment to God is the convictions of what he's given to me, but the compassion for my fellow human being and to love my neighbor as myself. May God bless you in doing the right thing. Thank you. <clears throat>